Good, thanks, guys. <coughs> All right, well, it's just gratifying to see some people that are coming back. <laughs> after having already subjected themselves to, uh, to one lecture this morning, so thanks. Uh, and and uh, I gotta say right up front, the ASME standards are inherent in what, in, in what we're doing, and I'm not gonna take a look at the standards uh, per se, but uh, we, we wrote the ASME standards here, and they're very good. We tried to take those to the ISO level, and the ISO just printed up the, whatever, 21578 or whatever, I can't remember all the numbers right in the right order, but, um, and, and it, uh, something was lost there in translation. I worked hard to try to keep the ISO the same as the ASME and it didn't work out. So uh, anyway, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about that and I've got a copy of the standards up in my office. So if anybody's interested in pursuing some details of the standards, I'd be glad to do that and we'll actually do that a little bit Tomorrow morning in the ASME B46 meeting when we do the ISO roundtable, I'll bring up some of those problems um, and, and we'll try to figure out what to do with it. Um, so uh, it, it, the, it, I had this talk ready last week and then we had uh, uh, Hassan who um, unfortunately wasn't able to make it. And I, I wonder if we should close that door so we get less noise from the hallway, please, thanks. Um, so uh, Hassan wasn't able to make it, and so then I expanded this into two, um, two lectures, and I can easily spend more than a whole day or almost a whole semester on this. Um, so the problem is actually just selecting the material. But I want to concentrate on what I think are the, the most important things here and the real um, sort of value, at, at least from our perspective in surface metrology, is coming up with correlations so I know what happens when I change process variables and I ought to process things to get the surface I want and in performance so I, I know what the surface I want looks like. Um, and then discriminating is important uh, because I've got you know, quality control issues. I, so often industry comes to us and says, here's a piece that works, here's one that doesn't work. You can't tell them apart using RA, what's going on? And then uh, so, uh, so there's value in being able to tell good parts from bad parts, obviously. So, um, so this is key to the, uh, you know, optimizing product process design. Um, or if we're looking at sort of degradation monitoring. Let's see, so, yeah, okay, I was trying to think, do we have all engineers here? One of the nice things about this is that, no, we don't have all engineers here. And so we have broader applications. For those of you engineers who are here maybe for the first time at one of these things, just let me give you a little bit of background so you can understand some of the perspective. You may be wondering why we have posters on things like teeth and you know, tools and presentations on that. A few years ago, um, a professor, uh, Peter Unger, um, contacted us and said, geez, we think we could use some of the methods you've developed in, in trying to tell um, what critters have been eating from the marks on their teeth. And, uh, and he convinced us it was worth uh, some of our time to take a look at this. And we started working with them on it. And I said, wow, the physical anthropologists are doing things with you know, analyzing topographies in ways that the engineers have not been thinking of. They've got a different set of problems, they're using the same tools, using software, and they're giving us insights that we wouldn't have had. And, and so we had a great time working with them, it was a great team. We actually, uh, we got uh, an article published in Nature, which is pretty exciting. Um, and, um, and, and we got a couple of uh, NSF grants and uh, we actually did much better than I do on my own. So it was a, a wonderful collaboration. Anyway, so that inspired us to say, well, let's do an international conference on surface metrology, regardless of the application. Because some of you are familiar with uh, materials and um, or metrology and property of engineering surfaces, met props. And uh, that's engineering surfaces. And we said, no, we're interested in surface metrology, regardless of what the application is. And, uh, and, and, um, and so those of you who were here yesterday morning know that the fourth international conference on surface metrology will actually be hosted by uh, physical anthropologists at the Zoological Museum in Hamburg. So that will be, 
when, will, when is that going to be? A year from this spring. So uh, it'll be 2014. And, uh, and I think it'll be a very interesting conference, a mixture of engineers and uh, non-engineers, and for the first time hosted by non-engineers. And so when people set up their exhibits, they'll be in between a stuffed walrus and a tiger or something with their measurement instruments. And uh, they've got an amazing collection of stuff. All right, let me get back to this. So what are we trying to do? Where's the value? Uh, so uh, you know, I, when I design something, I start, I'm looking at the performance. What do I want the thing to do? And the roughness controls so many things. So if it might be, say, friction, and I want to provide good friction, like on a roadway or something, I, I might have a relationship that looks like this, right? So the, the rougher it is, the better the friction, and, and, I, and I, uh, I might, there might be too much friction because maybe things start wearing up here, and then and too little friction, it's too slippery here, and so I get a kind of performance tolerance, that's, that's what I would like, and then here's the roughness tolerance that goes with it. But in order to uh, understand what the roughness tolerance is gonna be based on the performance tolerance, um, I need to know what this line looks like. And uh, so lots of times I have to establish this experimentally. And being able to establish this depends on how I characterize the roughness. And so some roughness characterizations won't give me a good line. In other words, I do the experiment, I get all kinds of funny scatter. Now when I go to manufacture the part, and I should have switched these axes because one becomes a dependent variable and the other is the independent. But all right, so you saw that change from performance to manufacturing. But now I want to manufacture a certain roughness, so we'll take this kind of this way, right? So I'm trying to get this roughness that I want for the performance, and I change the, uh, the process parameters. So when I change the process parameters, what happens to the roughness? The feed, for example, it's not a straight line. It goes, you know, it's a quadratic, but anyway. So I can say, all right, as long as my process variables are within this, then the roughness should be right, unless the tool breaks or does something funny. So I'd like to be able to design the processes like that. So uh, when we look at all of the things, and we, this, we don't, this is not collectively uh, exhaustive, this is not, I'm not pretending that I've thought of everything, but here's are some of the pop, uh, possible functional correlations, or things that should correlate with surface textures. So you know, you've got like light scatter, heat exchange, mass exchange, actually we'll be looking at mass exchange in a while, flow resistance we won't be looking at, and what are we looking at? We've got some friction, I don't think I have any of that. Where, da -da, it's, so there's all kinds of things where we know there should be a correlation with roughness and we, and, and we have a kind of intuitive idea that it's there and we go, yeah, but where's the, you know, where's the graph that shows me what it is? Where's something I can use to do product or process design? You know, how can I you know, sort this out with forensics? And um, so, uh, and it's not there. There's a lot for us to do. So, um, so what we're looking at here principally is the scale decompositions. This is the multi-scale approach. And, uh, and so this gives us uh, some insights that we haven't had because starting when we started doing we I was actually very young in the 1930s, but uh, when, when surface metrology actually starts in the 1930s, you know, they're doing sort of form and roughness and waviness. And so there we're basically we're all, we've been working with just three different levels of scale. The biggest one's form and that's kind of somebody else's problem. Waviness is kind of in between and sometimes we use it and some like that. And then there's roughness. And so all of the fine scale stuff just gets shoved into roughness and, and we don't go any further with it. So, uh, so what can we do if we start doing uh, better decomposition in scale? And, and so um, in this talk, I'm gonna look mostly at area scale. And in the next one, actually we're gonna do length scale, volume scale, and, uh, and curvature scale. Um, and then uh, sliding bandpass filters is another thing we're going to look at. So um, there's two basic kinds of tests we'd like to do. And, and these, these are really, um, the, we test for discrimination and, and the strength of the correlations. Are we able to discriminate and are we able to correlate? And these are the two basic tests that we're using to see, have we got a good system? In other words, are we using the right parameter to characterize things? And are we using the right measurement instrument? Because our ability to discriminate surfaces and our ability to find strong correlations uh, depend on having a good measurement, an adequate kind of measurement, and the right parameter to, to, to characterize it. So, um, so, so to start right off with the scale issue here and, and, and emphasize this, 
the surface is created, you know, maybe by manufacturing, maybe, you know, by um, when somebody used a tool and then it gets modified when it gets buried for years and then somebody comes and digs it up and maybe scratches it again or something. So, so we have some sort of surface creation or we, you know, we ground and lapped and, uh, and, and so this imparts a certain texture on the surface. And so this, this creation occurs at a certain scale. And there's, you know, the, the feed and machining, the abrasives, the whatever, there's a certain scale, the corrosion might be a very fine scale, so the surface created, at, it's at some scales. And then the behavior, is it good for adhesion, is it uh, going to be good for heat exchange, mass exchange, friction? So there's another scale where the sort of physical, chemical processes interact with the surface, you know, light scattering at a completely different scale, right? It could be completely different, it could be the same scale anyway, but it's a different process and there's no reason why this scale should be the same as this one. When I go to measure the surface, all right, I get some nice measurement instrument and I get, you know, an Olympus or an Alicona or a Zeiss or something, I make a nice measurement. And uh, there's a scale associated with that as well. In the measured texture, I've got a sampling interval, I've got, you know, I talked about yesterday, the sampling zone, and I've got the resolution of the instrument, and uh, so there's another scale associated here, and so what kind of, whoops, what kind of, I keep pushing the wrong button here, uh, what kind of sensor did I use, and, and, and then, uh, let's see, there we go, well, all right, so then I do the uh, analysis, so here I've got, you know, like a million elevations or more, perhaps, to deal with, you know, to, tens of thousands probably to, to millions, and, and they can make nice, uh, nice images. I can, uh, I can render a nice image from this. I can twist it around, look at all kinds of different directions with my nice mountain software or something, and, and change the colors, and, and a picture's worth a thousand words. But in the end, I'm an engineer, not a poet. I don't want a thousand words, I want a number. I don't want to say if it's, you know, if it's between this and this, it's good, and if it's anything else, it's bad. Or I need something where I can you know, do the correlation and the discrimination stuff. So I need to characterize this somehow so I have a number. And, and so this analysis, you know, like how do I filter this stuff uh, to get that number? So there's a scale there. So, uh, so, and these are all different scales. Creation, behavior, measurement, analysis, those could all be different scales. Now, when I go, I've got to characterize the, you know, am I going to characterize this with a feed or what sort of parameter, you know, am I going to characterize this with and, and same here, how am I going to characterize that? And uh, if I'm going to be able to discriminate or if I'm going to find functional correlations here, and that's what I'm trying to do is link these things, right, so I can do um, product design over here and process design over there or be able to tell, you know, this, you know, was this like a, uh, James Stemp is talking about in the other room, did the Mayans use this for bloodletting or not, right? Or uh, were these critters eating what? So, um, so the, uh, I need to have the same scale. In other words, has this scale that where the surface was created uh, been preserved in the measurement and the analysis, and so it exists somehow in this texture characterization? and then I could correlate here. Otherwise, if I've inappropriately uh, measured or uh, you know, filtered in the analysis, and, and this, somehow this scale is not captured here, then I won't be able to make that connection. Same over here. So I need to be thinking about what the scales are. So when I go to measure something, I, I might even be looking at the replica, which I sometimes am because like I got a grinding wheel that I don't want to take out of the machine and have to you know rebalance or something, or um, it's uh, you know we, we actually worked with a guy from Brown on dinosaur footprints and you know right so uh, for one reason or another we can't get it into the lab uh, so we take a replica or you can't get access to it so we have the measurement device. And then we have some sort of characterization software. Sometimes these are integrated, right? And sometimes they're separate. Like, you know, I can have a mountains map over here and I can have a, a Zeiss or something over there, right? Now, in the end, for engineering, um, you know, we've got a fairly narrow definition of what creates value. And one of the fun things about working with non-engineers is that there's a broader definition of what's valuable, <laughs> which, uh, which is refreshing when, uh, you're always looking at the bottom line, and you know, what's the ROI in this? 
And, and so engineers were particularly interested in reducing waste, although if I'm doing any kind of scientific analysis, I don't want to waste time. I've got you know, the grants and got to produce you know, certain things there. So there's, there's value actually added in, can I tell what this critter was eating? Um, anyway, so advancing science and you know, some of the basic sciences like physics, at what exchange, at what scale does heat exchange take place? How rough should a heat exchanger be? I don't think anybody really knows. Yeah, we do, you know, radiators with, all right, so gross scale is going to work. But if I, and we'll take a look at Newton's equation later. All right, so there's, there's basic science stuff that we don't know. And, and so we need this to support design, quality assurance, process control. All right. And, and so how do we get there? How do we do these things? Well, if we can't do the discrimination and correlation, I don't think we can do any of these things. So my contention is that this ability to discriminate and, and test correlation strength is fundamental to what we're trying to do in surface metrology. Now, a lot of the time, um, you're just trying to say, well, my customer wants to you know, make sure the RA is good, and so we're going to calibrate this, or so does the RA agree with that? So there's some other important problems. In, in surface metrology that relate to, all right, can we get agreement through the supply chain so that people are going to pay for the machine and the piece and so forth. And the, these are important problems. And so in academia, and, and we address those sometimes, uh, um, but uh, from a fundamental sense, um, I, I, and, and lots of times we're looking for RA and trying to do that. Why? Because RA is on the print. Why is RA on the print? Well, because it was on the print before. We still have RA on the print. You know, does this really correlate with what you're trying to do? Uh, who knows? But that's what we've been using, and it works. And so, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so one of the things I've been trying to do is say, well, let's see if we could start looking more fundamentally at what we might want if it wasn't RA. And so uh, some of you may have seen this already. A little exercise you can do in Excel. You put in a sine wave and take a look at the parameters. So it's going up and down between plus one and minus one. So the peak to valley is two. Then we can you know, just add up the, all the, you know, a bunch of discrete points uh, and uh, take the absolute value. Otherwise, it would come to zero, right? Because I get negative and positive. And then I can do the root mean square. And, and so I come up with these values. So there's, and, and so we start recognizing some things. All right, so there's a, um, you know, a familiar number. Now, if I decide instead of to take the, um, the maximum here at one, if I decide to take it at uh, whatever I use there, something much smaller, right? So whatever that is divided by 2.083, something, right? So I, I take a smaller value of that, and I get this little squiggly line. And so all these things change in the expected way. Okay, great. Now let me add them together and see what happens. So if I take the blue and add it to the green, I get the red. And, and one of the interesting things is, all right, the RT goes up a little bit because we get these things sticking up high there and going down low there. All right, so that makes sense. Uh, now we look at the RA. The funny thing, look at this. The RA doesn't change at all. <laughs> so the RA is completely insensitive to uh, the addition of this fine scale with the larger scale. So. Um, so the RA is not going to be up to every task that, that we would like it to be. The RQ is, is a little bit different. But uh, anyway, so, um, so the, the, you know, like this fine scale might be doing the light scattering. You know, this could be a shiny but wavy surface. And, and then if I add this to it, it now becomes a matte surface. And then, um, and, and, but I can't tell that with the RA. It's the same. All right, so uh, it was over 30 years ago now, I hate to think, that um, oh, about 30 years ago we, we came up with this. No, it wasn't. 25, something like that. Anyway, a while ago, started looking at this coastline analysis. I was in Switzerland at the time. And so the question was sort of how long is this profile? And and if I try to measure it with a certain sort of scale, in other words, I can step over it three times, and, uh, and it looks like it has a length of 120. If I use a slightly smaller step, it gets a little bit longer because I've got, I'm following sort of more faithfully the ups and downs. And if I go to a smaller step, it looks still longer, and you can see there's actually potential of smaller steps to get even longer, right? But already, if I compare this measured length with the straight line length, 
This is more than 45% longer than the straight line length. So there's a lot of hidden kind of dimension in this. And so that's sort of the principle. The interesting thing is that the length of a line is not, uh, a length of a squiggly line is, is not unique. It depends on the scale at which we, we try to measure it. And if we go into a little bit more depth on this, and we say, uh, well, what else could we learn from this? So the relative length um, turns out you can work it out. So here's a little step as we're stepping along the profile and we compare that to the projected length and uh, it turns out that the whole thing is going to be equal to one over the cosine of this angle. So that means this relative length that I was getting here by comparing my measured length to the straight line length is related to one over the cosine of the inclination on the surface. And so, well that might be useful for thinking about, um, you know, how something is going to cut, for example, or grinding kind of thing. And uh, it might also be useful for light scattering because I get inclinations coming off. And so, so the slopes on the surface, not, not only the length change with scale, but the slopes change with scale. That makes sense. I can't get more length without sort of having bigger slopes, right? Um, so uh, then we went to area scale, and in 2002 it was already a U.S. standard, and then uh, 2009 it got reapproved, and this is the uh, 251782. This is the one where it got a little botched up, and we got to sort of try to fix that somehow. I don't know how yet, but all right. So this is in surface texture area scale part two. So this is the ISO thing just came out in April. All right. So how do we do the area scale? So that was one of the things we actually got a patent on this algorithm, where we've let it expire, but the uh, the idea is how do we go from, we got a 2D measurement, we're doing a coastline, okay, now we're going to do 3D, and, and so we got to do a, an area. And so this was one of the first things we used it on. This was measured at UNCC. It was a nanoscope 2 scan tunneling microscope. This is a diamond coating on a silicon substrate, and the, why do you put diamond on silicon? Well, to lose heat. And, and so it's a jumble here of, you can see there's a lot of nucleation and growth for this thing. It gives a jumbly kind of chaotic surface. We also see, and this is a very old thing, this came, it's now like 23 years old, this measurement. Um, I know because I got this the first year I was at WPI and that was 23 years ago. But look at this edge here, it's all, so you can see the scanning lines here. But uh, so it, at the time it was, it was very good, but you know, we can do a lot better with it than that, I'm sure. So anyway, so the idea now is we used the line segment before and now we're going to use a triangle. And so we tile in uh, this way using triangles and, and the triangles get smaller and smaller. So we start off at a little above five square micrometers and we end up at 4,000 square nanometers. Uh, stepping down, we got more and more patches on here. Obviously, you can only do this with a high-speed digital computer because now we got 35,000 patches and we got to do sort of match each one to the surface and add up all the areas. And when you add up all the areas, all these little triangles, and then divide by the projected area that's covered by all the triangles, it turns out you got more than 50% more area than just the flat sort of x, y. So if this is the scale at which I'm losing heat, I'm going to lose 50% more heat right, than I would with a perfectly smooth surface. Um, but we don't know what the scale is for losing heat. so. Now we can plot this, and so here's the relative area, and there's the scale, right? And it looks the same for the relative length, and I'll go into that in more depth in the, in the next session. But so at the very large scales, it's one, and then we have the smooth rough crossover, because this is when it's one, when the relative area is one, the surface is basically smooth. So that means that uh, when I put the triangle on it, it's lying basically flat. And then eventually the triangles start falling into the valleys, climbing over the mountains, and there's this smooth rough crossover. Then, so the surface area seems to get bigger and bigger as I get to smaller and smaller triangles and I'm finding more and more details that I'm climbing over. And then one of the interesting things is here, we can have large uh, ranges where uh, we have a linear relationship between the uh, scale, the aerial scale, because it's squared. If we, if we were just doing length scale, it wouldn't be squared. And then, uh, and, the, and the relative length. And, and so we can work it out from the fractal stuff that, uh, the fractal dimension, and then what we did in uh, B46, ASME, is we said, all right, there's all these different ways of calculating the fractal dimension, you know, and, and, and there's the one true way is the way that everybody thought up, right, and it sort of it becomes almost a religious thing that, uh, 
this is the right way to calculate the fractal dimension. And there turns out to be many right ways to do it, depending upon who you're talking to. So we decided that uh, the one right way would be to let people know which way we're using. <laughs> this is the fractal dimension area scale, and it's defined as 2 minus 2 times this slope. And, and this turns out to have a fractal dimension of 2.14. Now, that being said, we started off doing this, as I said, uh, over 20 years ago. We, um, we thought the fractal dimension was going to be very important because that's what everybody was talking about. Oh, the fractal dimension. We can describe all the trees in North America with just 17 parameters using fractal dimensions. So we started off. We got quite a few trees left to go before and we gave up trying to see if we could describe them all. <laughs> so um, we thought, how exactly does this work? Well, as it turns out, what we're going to be seeing is that the relative area at a particular scale, that point ends up being a characterization. And these, all these lead to a multi-scale characterization. And which one do we want? Let's try them all. Let the computer sort it out. What was the, the there was a famous saying in France during the uh, religious wars. And I can't remember if it was the Protestants calling the Catholics or the other way around. And they were in some town they went into and they were, they were either trying to kill Catholics or Protestants, and they weren't sure which was which, and somebody said, kill them all, let God sort it out. <laughs> so, which scale do we try? Try them all, let the computer sort it out. <laughs> do you remember, do you don't know that? No? I thought all the French studied that. So some French guy told me that. I thought it was great. Yeah. <laughs> A nice metaphor since you know, nobody is alive from that time, if you remember that anyway. All right, so, but the, the steeper the slope, the more complex the surface is. And, and so, um, you know, this is a measure of complexity, the bigger the fractal dimension. And, and so if you've got a, a, a flatter slope, then it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, not as complex. So why do we have this, you know, here's a smooth rough crossover, and here's sort of a rougher, smoother crossover here, a second one. And, and, and what's happening is we've got less complexity because we're on the scale of the facets on the diamond crystals. And here we're looking at the complexity of that jumble of, of crystals. And we can kind of see that here. Uh, let's go back. It just, uh, so you can see here these, these patches at the 4,000 square meter, uh, nanometer scale, they're all tiling out on the facets. But at, at, at this scale, at the 0.2 you know, so micrometers, they're, they're not to the facet size yet. Certainly they're not here. So here the geometry is of the uh, sort of little crystals on big crystals, and here the geometry is the facets. So the, the 4,000 square nanometers is 1, 2, 3, 4 is about here, and you can see that's already in this range where uh, we're looking at the geometry of the facets. And here we're looking at the geometry of this collection of crystals. So we have a kind of decomposition here already. Here's the smooth scales. Here's the scale of the jumble of crystals. And here's the scale of the facets. And so we've got three different kinds of geometric character that we can look at there. So uh, similar to the length scale, it turns out that we, these triangular tilings relate to the inclination. And, and so we have a little tiling algorithm that we worked out and patented, but now anybody can do it because we, um, we let the patent expire. It's like the guys from Mercedes. Some, some patents are too important to enforce, right? So. <laughs> Area scale now belongs to humanity. All right. So, um, so, so we can go through this little derivation, and we come up with... Uh, so what we're looking at here um, is a, a, you know, a better representation of what's happening is actually the inclination of the normal to the tile to the normal to the nominal surface is what we're looking at. And we got a 1 over cosine. And, it, and, and you think, uh-oh, what happens when this goes to 90? Because this is going to go to infinity and then this screws up this average. And uh, the thing is that it can never get to 90 because I always have a sampling interval in my measured data. So I always have to move over something. So it doesn't matter how far I go up, I have, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get a zero cosine. And the other thing that happens is this is a, it's a weighted average. So I've got, and it's, um, so I've got this little projection. So even if this did go to 90, this did go to zero when theta goes to 90, a1 at the same time would go to zero. So zero there and zero there would 
divide out and I still wouldn't have zero. So I wouldn't have, you know, have, have infinity. So it's slopey tiles rule, so it's well behaved mathematically. So here's an example of a bunch of tilings and, and there's the slopes that go with them. And this is on a different surface. This turns out to be uh, a zebra mussel shell. Anyway, so the area, as we're saying, is important. It's important in heat exchange. So here's Newton's law of cooling. So we get the temperature differential and the area over which it can be exchanged and then some H, right, some constant. And this tells us the rate at which we're losing or gaining heat. This H is like material dependent, but the way we're doing our work currently, it's also taking into account the roughness. And, and so this, I could have the same materials in different roughness, I'd have to change the H now because the area I'm using is the nominal area. So if I actually started using the right area at the right scale, um, I might not have to be um, changing the, the H here all the time. Mass transfer, looks like it's gonna be the same thing, right? How much mass can I get in? I get an area term. Current density, that might be a little different, might, de might depend on radii, which I'll talk about in the next talk. Load transfer, okay, so all of these things are looking at area and this discrete interaction model. I'll go into that in more detail. So the area of the surface isn't unique, so which area should I be using in these fundamental sort of physics kinds of things that we use in engineering? And I'll tell you, I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> and, and so um, the problem is when I go to do this, now you know, for a long time ISO, we've had the developed area ratio, which is, um, it's in the, uh, um, mountain softwares and the standards. And so at what scale do we calculate the area in the developed area ratio? What's your sampling interval and your resolution? And we'll take what you got. So it's one point out of this whole thing, right? So, uh, so that's also scale bound. But in a way, you report the developed area without reporting your sampling interval or resolution. So it's no wonder nobody uses it. Anyway, so uh, so basically, if you want to do these tests, here's, you know, what we do. you do make a bunch of surfaces and maybe controlling the process variable so we get a nice range and, and we, we might actually try several different processes, do machining, grinding, um, uh, grit blasting, wire finishing. So we have fundamentally different surfaces instead of, because you do it all with machining, for example, you know, a whole bunch of things will correlate because the nature, the basic nature of the surface never changed. Anyway, so then we, we, we uh, um, uh, test the, uh, and then you test the surfaces. We got to measure the surfaces so to, um, you know, before you destroy them, obviously, right? So, um, so you measure the surface textures, you got to measure the surface performance. And then, um, so test, I think, yeah, measure, measure, okay. And then, uh, then you have to analyze the measurements and uh, filter, calculate the characterization parameters and then run the statistical test and see is it possible to discriminate or is it possible to, to correlate. So this is the basic set of experiments that you go through and actually I think it's tonight and uh, we've got a, a working group on um, functional correlations for uh, the B46 group and we'll be discussing um, that uh, standard that we're working on, the draft. So, uh, so here's, a, here, here's kind of a tough question but it gets to one of my other things that I like is uh, skiing and analyzing sort of ski and sports engineering problems. And, and, and so as it turns out that the uh, friction coefficient between the ski and the snow, of course, is very important in ski racing. And, um, and, and depends on the base texture or structures, the ski guys call it. And, uh, and they spend a lot of money working on this stuff. And so these, uh, you can get computer controlled grinding machines for doing your skis at $300,000 to, uh, to grind this. But uh, you know, if you're from an alpine country and it's really important that uh, to you how your ski racers do in the World Cup or something, so you do that. Now the funny thing about this is that uh, there's, uh, there seems to be little science in this. Anyway, so what we did was uh, we went and had a bunch of different skis ground different ways. This USST is something they developed for the US ski team, so we did it all up in New Hampshire, the grinding. And so we had five different grinding things and, and, and here's the process variables that we changed. You know, you can, and, and see all kinds of things you can change, right, in grinding. 
but it's the same stone, but you change the way you dress it. And uh, so you do a lot of dressing on this. And then you get the stone speed and the ski speed and how hard you press, right? And then we measured it with the uh, scanning laser microscope, and this was given to us by uh, Solarius, uh, it's a UBM. Uh, and uh, UBM actually s stopped selling these things a long time ago in Germany, but it's still, it's a, it's a rugged little thing, and it's actually working with the original electronics, and we put different sensors on it. But uh, anyway, so we measured the base of the skis, which was a little bit tricky, because you get this long ski, and it's scanning underneath the thing. And you can see we developed some measurement artifacts. But there's the, the ski base at a 100 micrometer sampling interval. Here it is at a one micrometer sampling interval. So we zoomed in. And you can see we're having trouble holding the ski still, because you can see these little lines going across there. And I doubt those are on, really on the base of the ski. And that was where the ski moved a little bit. Um, and, and so there's photo simulations from the different grinds. A and E are prep grinds. B, C, and D are all racing grinds. And, and by eye, it's hard to sort these out. But the experienced technician will go, uh, that's a fast one. Right here. <laughs> How do you know? All right. So um, anyway, you can see that uh, we had a lot of trouble holding the ski still on some of these. Holding the ski still, actually having it move as it's supposed to move. Um, let's see, where are we here? All right, so now we measured them. Let's analyze the measurements. Um, and, and some of you may have gone to Guillotin's uh, thing, you know, peak filtering. So this is spikes or doubtful, doubtful observations in the words of Pierce from 1852. Um, and then, uh, so you select filtering bandpass, or all right, okay. So here's our tiling thing on the base of the ski. And we were really trying to get the ski industry interested in supporting some research. The only thing they wanted out of the whole thing was, oh, these would be great to show, you know, to give people perspective of what the bottom of the ski looks like. That was, uh, so I gave them that, great, come on back. No, nothing. Anyway, so here's the area scale plot for a one micrometer sampling interval. And we can see we got pretty big relative areas there, right? For, they get, actually get a lot bigger than this, depending upon what you're measuring. Uh, so now we're going to do discrimination tests, um, and uh, so you could do F test or T test. We've been doing kind of modified F test, and then we make up a matrix to show sort of what's working, and then we do regression analysis. So uh, so here is C versus D. These are two race grinds. They they look uh, to me identical to the eye, but we can see there's a consistent difference in the relative areas of functional scale, even though the relative areas don't get real big. D is always a little bit smaller than C. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a statistical test at each scale. So at this scale, let's take a look at C and D and, and see if we can tell them apart in the scale, the scale, the scale. We can get out here, we go, you know what? Here it looks like it's going to be pretty easy to tell them apart because all the Ds are down there, all the Cs are up there. And, and so uh, if our statistical test is doing what it should be, we should expect we're not going to see much difference here. It should be very noisy because you know, there's, there's not much difference. The means are very small. And then out here, we should see that we should be able to sort it out. And we'll plot this versus scale. So here's the scale again, same scale axis. And then here's the mean square ratio. And this is what comes out of the F test. And so here is the minimum mean square for 90% confidence. So basically, if you give me another ski, uh, I can tell you if it's a C or a D grind, 9 out of 10 times, starting at a scale of about 1 micrometer. And, and we get better after that. So this goes up and down because it's a discrete calculation at each point. And here we're, you know, we're out in the noise on the smooth side of the smooth rough crossover. And, and so, so in here someplace, uh, we can start to tell the difference. And that's probably why they look the same, because we have trouble seeing a whole lot of stuff that's going on at, at these fine scales. So uh, at the large scales, we cannot discriminate. At the fine scales, we can. And so this is a multi-scale characterization. And we've shown that uh, the, this helps. Now, we could take a look and say, well, what about something else? Does anything else work? Oh, let's take a look at a finer scale, too. So here's the 10 micrometer sampling interval. We go, yeah, it doesn't look so good. Some of that might be because of the problem we had with the measurement. Remember the 10 micrometer sampling interval? And some of it might be because when we zoom way in, what are we seeing? We're seeing what happens when one grit 
gets dragged across the uh, the polyethylene, and it doesn't see what you know the rest of the dressing looked like or anything. It's just that one grit that's moving there. So if I zoom in at some level, I'm seeing one grit polyethylene interaction, and that might be what's out here, or it could be my measurement noise. So so we have a range here where you know we're except for that little bit there, where we're you know. Uh, over that range approximately, we're about 90% confident we can tell the difference. So if we believe that, and we go out and test those skis, then that would mean that the scale of interaction where the snow and the melt layer, it's a very complicated kind of friction situation, is interacting with the ski, that scale of interaction is in that range if those skis behave differently on the snow. That turns out to be a really difficult thing to figure out because every run down the snow is different and every skier is different. I've had two different pairs of skis, the skis are different. And so it's, it's a pretty hard test to do to see which one is really better. But uh, anyway, uh, so this is one way you can look at these things. So here, uh, fast, uh, fast Fourier, conventional analysis. Can we tell the difference and how well can we tell the difference? And so here we're summarizing it. And these are the different sampling intervals. Here's you know, C versus D, A versus C, right? So we selected a few of these to show you. And here's the area scale analysis. Now, in addition to be able to tell if there is a difference, um, the area scale can tell you the range of scales over which that difference exists. So that's nice if phenomenologically I want to go back and say, well, what was the scale of interaction that was controlling the performance? So. Um, so FFT, this is the, you can discriminate by inspection. And, and the, one of the problems is uh, with the FFT is I just, I got, you know, I replaced sort of one image with another. And, and so, you know, SAST, these, these could discriminate as well, um, but they don't give you a scale range. And A versus C, the only way we had to discriminate it was um, the uh, area scale and, uh, and, there's, and it scales below 10 square micrometers. Anyway, so, uh, and, and we published that if anybody likes to see more details in the journal Aware with uh, Sarah Jordan. Uh, right, in case you didn't get it the first time. This one we, we didn't publish and I'd still like to find some time to write it up. And this is one of our undergraduate students here, Corey Randall, who, who got data for the heights of the North and South Appalachians. Now, the, the theory here that we were, uh, our hypothesis was there should be a distinct difference between the mountains in the northern part of the Appalachian chain. So we took something from New Hampshire, New York, and Pennsylvania. Then the southern part where we're looking at, uh, let's see, this would be Virginia. So Virginia, West Virginia, and I'm not going to tell you that I can't remember the name of that state over there. What is that? Kentucky or something? All right, good. I'm glad some other people aren't getting it. And this would be North Carolina down here, but I forget what state that is. It's Kentucky and Tennessee or something over there. All right. Anyway, um, so the thing was the glaciers stopped about here someplace in the middle of Pennsylvania. So the process that created these mountains, right, they got pushed up and it was, say, let's say it was similar all along the east coast of the United States. The mountains, like they all got weathered for a while. And then there was a couple of miles of snow and ice on these for, I don't know, however long. And so the question is, would they be different in the north and in the south? And uh, so here we go. Yeah. It turns out the southern mountains are rougher and actually also more complex. So we're going to look at the, the slope here. So the blue is the south, the red is the north. I kind of got that backwards politically because uh, in any event. So. Um, so we can also look at the slope here as a function. This is actually the fractal dimension. Now the, the, the thing that is a little bit weird about the, uh, uh, let's see, that's using relative area. Let me just go back. The thing, this, the slope, remember, relates to the fractal dimension and we call it the complexity in the uh, ASME standard. Um, the, the thing that makes this um, uh, kind of funny is that the idea was that the fractal dimension would not be scale sensitive, but we can clearly see the, uh, the, the shape of these curves changes with respect to scale. So in fact, the fractal dimension is not insensitive to scale in, in, in reality when you calculate it this way. 
Anyway, uh, we could talk about the mathematics of that some more. But here we're highly confident. There's 99% confidence. So it scales finer than, uh, so here's 10, uh, here is a, a million square meters. So that's one square kilometer, five, uh, 100,000 square meters. So we're somewhere getting down to, uh, there's 1,000 square meters. So somewhere well above the size of a football field or so. We're, um, we're able to tell if we're in the north or the south. And, and so, you know, and, and, and we're, start, we're able to start telling this somewhere around half a, half a square kilometer or so, we start getting something statistical there, maybe a little smaller, tenth of a square kilometer. So certainly glaciers were acting on the surface of that scale, so that's a hypothesis. And, and here we do a little bit better, and we pick this up sooner if we use the complexity. And so that's kind of like the fractal dimension. Um, all right, so taking a look at uh, some grinding stuff. This came from San Gobain. This is a, uh, some of our undergraduates who are working on this. And, and we had a bunch of grinding wheels, and the question was, can you tell them apart? So we've got a dressed region and a ground region, and we've got a whole bunch of different grinding wheels. And uh, so we brought them in and measured them on the UBM. Uh, now here's a, a place where we went to using um, replicas because the material on the grinding wheel interacts with the laser that we had and scatters the light all over the place. And so we had difficulty getting any kind of reasonable measurement. So when you use the replica, or you probably could have coded it as well, but we put the replica on, then, uh, uh, then we're able to measure that. And th there's obviously some loss. But uh, the question isn't so much as, um, you know, is there some loss? There obviously is. Was there, is there enough of the uh, uh, topography that's retained so we can still tell the difference? And uh, so here's the, the area scale business that I talked about. And so, uh, and here's what we're doing. Again, you know, we do um, area scale and here's the mean square ratio. And so here's comparing two different wheels. I don't know which ones they are. But uh, so here, we can see at about just about uh, 200,000 square micrometers, I can start to tell the difference between the two of these things. They're statistically different you know, below there. So there's the, there's the discrimination test. Oh yeah, there we go. There's the area scale comparison. So at about 200,000, we're seeing, oh yeah, yeah, the black and the blue are pretty separate there. And, and, and they, they stay pretty separate for a while. Then they mix a little bit. And we can see the mean square ratio goes up and then down. So as a function of scale, the mean square ratio gives us you know, what we're expecting looking at the plots of the two things. So area scale is a good way of telling these two grinding wheels apart, whichever it was. We had a whole bunch in the test. And so then we made up a matrix. So, and the, these are the names for the grinding wheels, B1D, B2D, so forth. And, and so, and, and since the matrix will be symmetric and the diagonal isn't interesting, since we better not be able to tell B1D and B1D apart, although sometimes we put those kinds of tests in our batch and do the test and do the extra measurements to see if we're fooling ourselves. <laughs> and, uh, and, and to make sure that we can't tell the same surface apart. Uh, which is a question that comes up last time we're looking at things like stone tools and somebody's making some tools and you go, yeah, all the fractures on the stone tools could be different. Um, and, and so maybe I can always tell the tools apart and I take two tools that I've broken and then take one and go scrape hides with it and the other saw antlers or something and I go, they were different before and they're different after. So, so we want to make sure that uh, maybe if they were different before, is that scale range different than the scale range in which they're different after, for example. So that gives us another dimension to explore. So it's, lots of times it's important to explore this diagonal. In this case, we, did, we decided it wasn't. And uh, anyway, so here's the way we've talked about this is using area scale. 83% of the time we get discrimination um, at some scales or all scales. And, and here's the scale ranges. And I guess we could have left this you know, below 10 to the fifth because that was where we started being able to tell the difference. But, uh, so um, anyway, so, so there's a way of showing at a glance how good is some parameter at doing this. And then we could say, well, what about uh, you know, other parameters? So here's area scale compared to PA. All right, so with no filtering, um, so 
this meant are they, and actually we changed the word we were using. At one time we called it differentiable, meaning could we see the difference? But this gets confused with calculus and we didn't want to scare anybody thinking we were, or, or falsely impress anybody thinking we were using calculus. So, uh, so we changed it to discriminate. But uh, in this case, 95% um, uh, discrimination you could only get in, uh, in these ones where it's light blue. And uh, it's interesting that some of these are actually different than the area scale. Which are, are this, you know, we couldn't get this one with area scale, but we could get this one with PA. And uh, I think there's, there's a few that are like that. Anyway, so there's discrimination. Let's take a look at correlation. And here's the discrete bonding model that we use. And this could just be called a discrete interaction model as well. So the idea here is that interactions like adhesion can be discretized on a surface. And it's something that, you know, it's, it comes to us, you know, from the Greeks. You know, it's a, the idea of the atomists, you know, the Greeks who said you can only divide matter so far before you come up to a fundamental unit of matter and then you can't divide it anymore. Now, the ISO, when they're dealing with surfaces, uh, always has their stuff written in calculus, right? And it's uh, integrals, and I go, yeah, I really like to decorate my, my writing with these integrals and partial derivatives. And it looks pretty cool all over the page. But in fact, I'm measuring these things digitally, right? I, I'm, I don't have a continuous measurement. And so, and, 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 and I kind of object to that because fundamentally underneath this is this concept that everything's really smooth. And if I just look at it closely enough, I'll find it smooth. And instrument manufacturers, lots of nobody here say, but uh, instrument manufacturers, well, maybe they do. The way you sell an instrument is you meet the customer's expectations. I thought it was going to look like that. That's good. That's what I didn't think it was look like that. That's a bad measurement, right? And so if fundamentally the customer thinks it's going to be smooth, give them smooth. <laughs> That's what it takes. And I remember we were working with uh, an instrument manufacturer a long time ago. It's no longer in business, but uh, they would... Um, develop a new filter, whatever it takes, to, to put in the software to sell the instrument. Oh, this doesn't look right to me. Well, what do you think would be right? Here you go. <laughs> Great. Make the sale. But, and that sounds sort of funny, but that is, uh, we, we do that all the time. Uh, Richard Leach, you know, NPL, you know, head guy for surface metrology in, in the UK, said, can I measure a surface? He goes, if you tell me what it is, I can measure it. <laughs> which is a little bit discouraging. Come on, Richard, we thought you could do better than that. Come on, <laughs> measure the surface. Uh, if I, and, and, and so often, if, if we're doing a measurement that meets our expectations, we go, great, we're done. If it doesn't, we scrutinize it. And so I try to train students, no, if it meets your expectations, you still scrutinize it. It's not time to go home yet. Try it again, is it repeatable, can you get it? You know, you, 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 you need the doubt, you gotta, uh, you, you, you can't just go back and remeasure only when you don't like the result. So that's not good science. Anyway, so, um, so things are not, uh, so, so my point is, especially in the, the fractal thing, is that you know, when we zoom in and don't use any special filters for, um, for smoothing things, things look rough. And, and I know, we, you know we've worked with some people with AFMs and we go down to uh, looking at cleave to mica where we can actually see the, this was with uh, Bosch and Loam, you know, their AFM for looking at contact lenses. And we analyze cleave to mica. I mean, how do you get smoother than that? And it's rough at a fine scale and it's got a area scale, you know, um, it's got a relative area that's greater than one. And I think, you know, it makes sense because even if I would get down to the electron cloud level, I don't know where the cloud is all the time. I use Schrodinger's equation, it's moving all the time. The surface is rough, even if I get down to a layer of atoms. So, um, so, the, uh, so the surface may be better than, a, you know, a smooth at some scale to say it's actually continuous and nowhere differentiable, which is what a fractal is, a continuous surface. So it's all, you know, one surface never stops, but it is nowhere uh, differentiable, meaning I can't fit a slope to it. I can't fit a tangent to it. Now, the next step is let's start taking a look at surfaces that aren't continuous, the porous surfaces, grinding wheels. Let's actually start looking at those and as, as uh, 
Marcin was, was talking about the CT scans. Now how are we going to analyze those? So something I want us to look at. But let's get back to this problem. So the Greeks break stuff down until they get the atoms, and there's the groups of atoms, so you can't break it down any further. Planck comes along and says energy is not continuous, comes in quanta. And digital computers come along and say, we don't really care what it is, but it's a lot easier to represent in zeros and ones. So <laughs> let's do that rather than continuous functions. And, uh, and so, uh, so the thought was, all right, when I have adhesion, maybe this is like a discretizable phenomena, that an adhesive bond forms on the surface, and then I've got to move over to form another one. I can't do, you know, one right there, and there. it's a discrete number of bonds. And I could look at catalyst reactions and say, yeah, I've got a reaction going on here, and I can't have anything else going on there because that's taken up with that one. So I've got to move over a certain distance before I can do it again. Right? And so it's a discrete thing, and I can sort of a patchwork kind of fashion, I could, uh, I can, you know, say, all right, I've got these things going on on the surface. And so then, they, and each patch is going to take up a certain size. And so then I can get the intensity of the interaction, depending on the roughness of the surface, by doing this tiling. That was the way I worked out the tiling thing initially. And, and so it's based on these things are discretizable, they're not continuous. So when I look at the adhesion, if I take a coating on a surface and cut it up fine enough, finally there's a little size where bing, the coating pops off. I just made it too small and it's not going to stick anymore because I it's got just too small a size. So that's the idea. So if I look at this overall, say, adhesive strength, ST, is going to be equal to the strength of one of these bonds times the number of bonds I have, which is going to be pretty big, right? Especially if it's like atomic kind of scale. So I got a, a big number of bonds, and then I divide it by the projected area, so the units on this are like pounds per square inch or um, uh, pascals or some sort of force per unit area. Then there's the, the total projected area, and there's the strength of one. All right. So now, if I say, well, how many interactions am I likely to have? Well. Let's take a look at the area for one bond, all right, so that's going to be pretty small. And let's take a look at the total surface area, but make sure it's at the scale of that bond. Because remember, there's all kinds of different ways we can calculate the area, and we come up with lots of different things. So we've got to make sure this is at the scale of the bond here. So this ratio, this is going to be pretty big. Now, being an experimentalist that always has trouble with his experiments, I put in a fudge factor. And the fudge factor is going to be between 0 and 1. So maybe none of these sites are working. Maybe they're all working. And, and so M, is, uh, M can vary between 0 and 1. Now, it might vary systematically, too. Think about this, because if I'm trying to do adhesion, I might have a very narrow valley, and the stuff can't get into the valley to adhere. I might be able to measure that area, but systematically, I can't get my stuff in there. Or if I have a catalytic reaction, actually you can add not the same reaction will go in because it's starved for reactants or something. So this, this M may be systematic in a function of the surface, but let's not worry about that too much. For now, let's just think about it. I get some dirt on it or something just didn't happen there. So if I substitute N, uh, you know, this relationship for N, and uh, so then this thing uh, looks like this. Um, and, and I rearrange, I substitute and rearrange. So now I've got the M term still, and this first term is the strength per unit area of one interaction. So I said I could discretize this, I get into one, here's one bond, and so here's the strength of the bond, there's the area of the bond, so this has got units of like pascals or pounds per square inch or something. And then uh, this term over here is an area ratio. This is the total surface area at the scale of the bond, divided by the projected area, and that turns out to be the relative area, which is the way the whole thing got started um, 25 some years ago in Switzerland when I started thinking about this. So, uh, and this has always got to be, as we've seen, greater than or equal to one, because I can't pile the surface over and come up with something less than the whole surface, right? So, so there it is. So one of the neat things about this was a student who was working with me when I developed this went to work at EMPA, in Thun, Switzerland, and this is Swiss German for federal materials testing something or other. And, uh, uh, and so he said, we're interested in doing this on thermal spray. And I thought, oh God, thermal spray. That's going to be way too difficult because you have, 
you know, this liquid particle that comes in and splashes onto a surface. And I don't know what the scale interaction is. Use xerography or something where I get little particles that are coming in, staying the same, getting spread out. Can, let's test this theory on something besides thermal spray. Yeah, now, thermal spray is what we're doing. So we're going to do the test on thermal spray. All right, okay. So we so, um, started off by um, uh, getting this, polishing the surfaces, then rough them up with grit blasting. And, and then there's all kinds of parameters you can change in the grit blast thing. I was not thinking, oh, God, we use the same grit blasting operation. We want to do different stuff. You know, we're doing grit blasting. All right. So we had soft to hard surfaces and, you know, four bars. So this is one time under the grit blaster. And, and, and see the hard surface, you can see one time under the grit blaster it clearly isn't marked up as much as that one. And ten times under the get more and more marked up. All right. Uh, interesting enough, they're using UVM, and the other reason I didn't think this was going to work at all was because they were using a stylus tip. I go, oh, come on, we want to measure to a finer scale than that. We won't get the surface at, you know, we're not going to get to the fundamental scale with a five micrometer stylus radius and, you know, two micrometers. All right, okay, but that was all we had. So we went ahead. And, and so these are some of the measurements. These are actually pretty cool. So here's the uh, hard one. You can see impact from one uh, grit on the surface there as he goes in, skids to a stop and piles the thing up. And here in the softer one, you see the same thing, but it's a bigger pile up in the intermediate ones. And then after five times, you can't really distinguish individual ones very well. I still see some stuff that might be unaffected. And after 10 times, the whole surface is completely beaten up. So that sort of made sense. Now what we're shooting for is what's the right scale. So that gives us the right relative area, you know, for the, for that interaction. So um, the process, they did vacuum plasma spraying, and this is the facilities in Tune where they did that. And then uh, this is their, their symbol there. And then, uh, so we did these cylinders, then you glue another cylinder to it and you pull it apart in a straight pull with uh, the self-aligning puller things. And, uh, and so what you have to do is the glue that you use on this thermal spray coating has got to stick to the other side better than the thermal spray coating sticks to its substrate. And, and so you got to take a look after you pull it apart to make sure that you had what's called uh, an adhesive failure so that you actually pulled the coating off rather than a cohesive failure, you might have pulled the coating apart, right? So we only use the adhesive failure ones. And so here's the adhesive strength versus relative area. Now, in the whole thing here, what adds value is when we can take a parameter that gives us some function, like we want to have good adhesion because the thermal spray is used, for example, to go uh, as a thermal barrier coating on uh, uh, turbine blades. And when we d don't want the thermal barrier coating coming off, right, because this would be bad for the morale of the passengers in the airplane if this happens. Right? So, um, and, and so then the uh, RA, so that's the average roughness, what happens here? Well, these actually, the adhesion was so bad that they, it fell off, so that's why it has zero adhesive strength. Um, and, and we can see, yeah, I, I should have put the line on here. I'm sorry, I didn't put the line on. And, and, and it's, you put a line on there and you calculate the regression coefficient, and it's 0.58. So you go, all right, so 58% of the variation in adhesive strength we get explained by the variation in RA. Go, all right, so that's not so bad, perhaps. But, we thought there should be something there. Uh, I said, but let's see if what we can do with relative area. So I thought, well, let's go right to the finest relative area scale because I think we're not going to go fine enough. And, and then, so we plot the line. There, I get the line on this time. And, and there's the adhesive strength, eh, 63. 58 to 63, well, it's better, but I'm not going to get too excited about that. But all right, 58, so, okay, great. So, uh, yeah, it's a little bit better. Not quite 10% better, but almost 10% better, okay. Then uh, Stefan Zygman, who was working on this at EMPA, said, what about if we do this? Let's consider one substrate, because we had all four hardnesses mixed in there, and maybe there's some sort of chemical effect or something. So let's separate these, four different. And we'll plot adhesive strength as a function of relative area at a particular scale, right? Because we'd just gone to the finest scale. I thought, you know, you guys, it was two cores. You know, so let's go to the finest scale, see if it works. He says, let's do it over a range of scales. So we'll just use the finest scale. We'll use some coarse ones, too. Go, That's not going to work. Let's just do it and see what happens. So we'll calculate the regression coefficient in each scale and then plot the regression coefficient as a function of scale. 
And we, we call this a Zygmunt plot. I've lost track of Stefan. I don't know what he's doing now. But anyway, so here, and, and, and we sort of messed this up. We get the relative area over here before it was down below. And here's the adhesive strength. So just make that adjustment in your heads and take a look at this. So, so at the, uh, it, it, this is a big scale, over 100,000 square micrometers. Regression coefficient is terrible, right? 0.22, here's a little bit finer, 0 0.38, 0 0.64, 0 0.88. You go, wow, that's encouraging, all right? So that, you know, above 0.5, I'll get excited about that. So that's, uh, uh, that's we got 30 percentage points there. So we're better than half again, right? Bigger, so that looks pretty good. Better than RA at 25 square micrometers. So if we plot this now, R squared, there's the uh, adhesive strength um, versus relative area, the correlation coefficient. This gets quite strong, almost up to 0.9. And the other interesting thing is, is it varies in a kind of regular fashion, right, as we get closer and closer to what might be the fundamental scale. Now, one of the things we know too is that the, we're using a five micrometer stylus in this, I think it was two micrometer sampling interval anyway. So it works out right in here someplace. We think we're gonna start losing resolution because of the stylus uh, uh, tip size. So let's try all the different ones. And uh, I think this is, the, this is the one we were just looking at, maybe, or maybe it was this one. Anyway, when we look at all four of these, we can see two of them are just about up to 90. This one seems to go up and back down again. That one seems to go back down again. And that kind of fit what we were, uh, uh, so one of our expectations is that so this is too large for the, uh, um, for the phenomena. So the, the, the adhesion phenomena is, is smaller than this. And, and then this, if it goes back down again, that's too, too small. So we're not getting good correlations because we're underestimating the fundamental size. And, and this is just right. So this is what we call the Goldilocks scale, right? The one's too hot, the other's too cold. The other's just right, remember that? Uh, maybe if you... When you have small children, you'll have to read this again. Okay. So, um, anyway, so the conclusion is that it seems to work. This is published here. And, uh, and if you want copies of any of these, let me know, or copies of the slides too. All right, so here's um, uh, a material, and we're looking at fractography. So we're breaking this. And uh, this is uh, a composite material. Worldwide sales, I think, are six billion dollars a year in this material. Um, and uh, so we broke it in three-point bending, and we measured the force during fracture, and we, we did it at different temperatures. We did it over a range of temperatures. It turns out it's a very high homologous temperature, so it's, it, it melts um, just below body temperature, uh, this, this particular material. And so we're looking for correlations between the um, relative areas that we measure on the fracture surface and the uh, uh, temperature work of fractures. So here's, here's the load, and there's the displacement during fracture, and there's all the different temperatures. So this is um, 35, it's, uh, so it's getting pretty soft there. It's almost at its melting temperature. 10, it's kind of stiff there, so it's kind of cold for this material. Does anybody know what the material is? So uh, here it is, um, here's the fractography, and you can see it changes markedly from 10 to 35 degrees. So as it gets warmer, um, the, uh, the fracture surface changes clearly, right? So, so we measure the fracture surface. Figured it out yet? Is it an eraser? What, no. Chocolate chip It's Hershey's chocolate. <laughs> So chocolate's like six billion dollars. People are laughing at us for studying chocolate and go, all right, so what's the worldwide market for your material, Smarty? <laughs> anyway, so we measure this, uh, spatial resolution is about 25 micrometers in this particular setup. This is a scanning laser microscope that we made with support from NASA for measuring runways. This is our laboratory setup with the scanning tables here. When we go into the runway, we put them up here and we've got a different gantry to hold it. But here's the, uh, here's the um, fracture, measured fracture 10 to 35, so our two extremes. And the reason this melts actually just below body temperature, and I didn't know this until I started working with the food scientists that told me about this, because I never actually left chocolate in my mouth long enough to melt, right? I was 
a little bit too anxious to chew it up and swallow it. But um, so it's designed to melt at just below body temperature, so it takes heat out of your mouth and it feels cool. But you have to eat chocolate more calmly than I usually do. Right? So the next time you have a piece of chocolate, if you're patient, see if you can feel it cooling your mouth as it melts, right? And it takes the heat of fusions going into the chocolate. Anyway, area scale analysis we've been talking about. So there's a tiling thing. And so now, um, so here's all the different temperatures and, you know, the, and, and we've got the means. So we get, we're looking at the means, relative area versus scale. And it looks like kind of a jumble. So we're going to test the, you know, we're going to do regression analysis at each scale as we go up, just like we did for the thermal spray. And then calculate the R squared and plot that versus, uh, um, uh, versus the scale. So here's the relative area versus temperature. There's the R squared at uh, like a million square, over a million square micrometers. R squared 0.44. Yeah, it's not that great. But, yeah, it's six, about 17,000. R squared 0.99. Wait a minute, guys. Looks like we're cheating. And then if we go to a finer scale, it drops off again. And there's the plot. So the expectation was, you know, we can get two finest scale and two coarsest scale, and there's a region in the middle where it's just right. So we're able to, uh, for whatever that's worth, which is apparently not much, because we tried to influence Nestle, and there's nobody, I can't get anybody influenced. You're going to leave or none of the big food companies. Don't you, aren't you interested in the way chocolate breaks? No, not really. <laughs> but, but what if you're chocolate break? Yeah, we don't have any trouble with chocolate. We sell chocolate. All right. But uh, so maybe forensics, you know, you could use it. <laughs> Actually, the, and I'm trying to remember the guy's name from uh, Bay Path Community College, Nick. That's all right, whatever his name was. He had this idea for car accidents because, you know, the uh, plastic has a, a characteristic fractography that depends on temperature as well because you get, you know, like the glass. Right? So if you wanted to figure out what temperature a car accident took place and you could, you know, collect up some of the broken lenses or something, right, from that and know that that fracture was made at the, when the accident took place rather than after it got run over or something like later. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. I think it would make more sense to do it on plastics, but you can download the surfaces of the database and just run them through this. Yeah. All right, but well, we should talk about that. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know Nick, he does uh, forensics. And I'm, I'm not a forensic scientist. I'm a, I apply that I, I play with forensics. Okay, thanks for <laughs> explaining that. He's, anyway, all right, so that was published in, in where we presented that actually at MetProps a few years ago. Um, so the, 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 the basic thing here is that decomposition by scale can improve our ability to uh, discriminate and find correlations, which are the two things, you know, in, particularly in, in research that, that, uh, that'll add value. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the support we get from Olympus and DigitalSurf, Safina, SFRAX, and thank you for your attention. So this is supposed to come in at 90 minutes, but it didn't quite. So we're, we're a little bit early. So we've got plenty of time for questions. And uh, I could give you an advertisement for the next talk. <laughs> you want to see why should I come?